Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Command Volley Podcast. I'm your host Landon and joining me today is Griffin. What's up guys? For today's episode, we're super excited to be giving you our review of 15 cards from the upcoming Jumpstart set. So today, Command Valley is going to be providing you with our list of the 15 cards that you should be picking up from Jumpstart for your Commander decks. Keep in mind, this is just our personal opinions. You may disagree, you may agree, and that's okay, but this is going to be our own personal take on these cards for your Commander decks. This is a super unique set. There aren't a whole lot of new cards in this set, and in the new cards that they do have are a lot of legendary creatures. So particularly for this set, we're just going to be going over basically all of the legendary creatures and like five non-legendary creature cards. Um, so we don't want this to be a super long review. There aren't a ton of new cards, but these are our opinions on these legendary creatures. Before we dive into the 15 cards from the new Jumpstart set, just like to give a huge shout out to this channel's sponsor, Game Grid Lehigh. If you're in the Utah County area, you need to check this store out. They've got an awesome staff, super friendly, super helpful. They've got an awesome selection on cards and card accessories and deck boxes and dice. They've got a massive card archive, so they're always going to have the card that you need or looking for for your commander deck. They've also got an awesome selection on D&D stuff as well as Warhammer. Also, if you're new here, we'd really appreciate it if you consider hitting that subscribe button. It's a quick and free easy way to support the channel and it really does help us. Another perk to subscribing is you're going to stay up to date on all of our deck decks that come out every Monday and our gameplay videos that we release every month. We've also got some deck techs already out for some of the legendary creatures in this set, so we'll point those out when we get to them, and we'll have links for those in the show notes. Without further ado, let's go ahead and begin. We'll go ahead and go over the legendary creatures first, and then we'll cover the non-legendary cards that we recommend. First up, we've got Emil the Blessed. For two white white, we have a 4-4 legendary creature unicorn who reads, For three generic, exile another target creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. Then, whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay Selesnya, green or white. If you do, put a plus one plus one counter on it. If it's a unicorn, put two plus one plus one counters on it instead. So the real trick to, to Emil when you're building it, if you're either building a commander deck out of Emil or putting it in the 99, is the first text. The ability to be able to blink something for just three generic mana is... is you can abuse that ability very easily. It makes you think almost of a Yarrick deck, except you can do this multiple times instead of just having, you know, two triggers when it comes into play. So Wood Elf or Farhaven Elves, you can blink these multiple times to just get a bunch of lands into play under your control. You can make a token deck and just overrun the board and then just blink a Crater Huff Behemoth every single turn to keep your, your, to keep your onslaught going. Blink a Crater Huff Behemoth twice in the same turn if you just need that extra oomph to get, uh, to get, past your, your opponent's blockers. So there is a ton of things you can abuse. Something as simple as you can bounce a Wall of Blossoms, which is a defender that draws you some cards. You can get Revelark, which can get you creatures with power two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. An Acidic Slime, which destroys an artifact enchantment or, or land. Eternal Witness, which can just get any card from your graveyard. And there is just a slew of other cards that you can fit into this deck that gives you a ton of power and potential. So if I were building in a mill deck, what I would focus on, since we're in green and white, we have access to green, which means we have access to a lot of ramp, is just ramp out a ton and just get these little creatures onto the battlefield and blink multiple times to just get this overarching powerful state on the board and then start casting these big creatures, these big effects, and then bouncing them multiple times. I'd also look at that activated ability as a way of protecting some of your creatures too. So if, you know, one of your key creatures is going to get killed, you can blink it with a meal to fizzle the kill spell. Unfortunately, it can't blink itself, but I think that it has that option. I think that's super, super necessary. And I would definitely put ways in the deck, other ways in the deck of protecting a meal, because that seems like a pretty key piece to the deck. So. All right, so one thing I wanted to remind everybody about Emil is that in her text box, we have that Selesnya symbol. And what the way that commander identity works or color identity works in commander is that there is a color in the text box of the card, it counts towards the color identity. So because there is a dual symbol of Selesnya, green and white, that means that Emil is a green and white commander, which means you can put green and white cards in it. There's a cycle of commanders in the set that have the same hybrid mana symbol that also applies with the same rules. So just keep that in mind as we go through the other creatures in the set. There, There is a cycle of them, like Griff said. Um, they have some type of activated ability in on the card that requires a hybrid mana, which makes the creature two colors. 
Moving on to blue, we have Bruvac the Grandeloquent. He is a legendary creature human advisor that costs two and a blue. And he reads, if an opponent would mill one or more cards, they mill twice that many cards instead. And the reminder text says, to mill a card, a player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. This is a super awesome card, really exciting. This is the first legendary creature that we have that actually says mill on it. I know that there are other mill commanders like Finax, but... I think Bruvec really wants you to be all in on that mill strategy. And there are a ton of super powerful cards in Mono Blue that you have access to that can just mill your opponents out in one shot. We've got Fleet Swallower, super massive fish. When it attacks, the defending player mills half their library. So with Bruvac out and you attack someone with Fleet Swallower, they're just going to mill their whole library. And on their turn, they're probably going to lose. Same thing with Traumatize for a uh, three and two blue. An opponent is going to mill half their library, but with Bruvac out, their whole library just gone say goodbye in their graveyard if they don't have any shuffle effects they're just screwed on their turn there are a ton of enchantments that just mill our opponents out every turn slowly chipping in and with Bruvac out it just doubles that process some really good cards to put into this deck would be fraying sanity which doubles up the amount of mill that you put on an opponent at the end of their turn drown secrets which makes your opponent's mill when you play a blue spell Teferi's Tutelage, which mills your opponents when you draw a card. Same thing goes for Psychic Corrosion. And then Sphinx Tutelage, which is really just a powerhouse in this deck that can, that can mill your opponents for a ton if they're playing one or two color decks. I'm also in the process of working on a Bruvac deck tech that I will hopefully have released in the next week or so. Um, definitely want to check that out. I'm super excited to play this deck. I'll also be playing it in an upcoming gameplay video. So if you're interested in seeing how the deck works before you want to invest in it and purchase it, you're definitely going to want to stay tuned for that. Next up, we have Inyaz the Gale Force, which is probably the most exciting one for me. He is 3 blue blue for a 4 4 legendary creature Jin with flying. For 2 in Azorius, blue, white, white, blue, attacking creatures with flying get plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. Then, whenever 3 or more creatures you control with flying attack, each player gains control of a non land permanent of your choice controlled by the player to their right. Now, at first, I thought maybe you could make a Jin tribal deck out of Inyaz, but at, after looking through it, you probably want to build a flying tribal deck that really just abuses that mechanic of switching things around. Now a couple of things that I really like about Inyaz is that you can use his ability as soon as Inyaz comes out onto the battlefield. He doesn't, he's not required to attack in order for that trigger to go off. The second thing is that you choose which things are being switched around and it's non-land permanent which means you can switch around enchantments, artifacts, planeswalkers, as well as creatures and then the third thing which a lot of people are missing out about this is that you don't actually target any of these non-land permits you're just choosing them which means it gets around hexproof it gets around gets around hexproof gets around shroud and it gets around protection so it may seem a little mean to be switching around people's permanents and you don't necessarily want to be switching around people's commanders because that may make them a little bit upset but there's some really cool things that you can get away with with inyaz by giving people enchantments that kind of suck We've got, we've got a couple such as nine lives from Corset 21, which is one white white for an enchantment with hexproof. If, if a source would deal damage to you, prevent that damage and put an incarnation counter on nine lives. And when there are nine or more incarnation counters on nine lives, exile it. And when it leaves the battlefield, you lose the game. So you play it, you attack an opponent to your right with nine flyers, you switch nine lives over to them, you hit them for nine, and they immediately lose due to nine lives leaving the battlefield. Illusions of Grandeur, which is three and a blue for an enchantment with a commutative upkeep cost of two. When it enters the battlefield, you gain 20 life. And when it loses the battlefield, you lose 20 life. So you play it for four mana, you gain 20 life, you switch it to your opponent, and when it leaves, they lose 20 life. That's my favorite way of abusing a card. We've also got a couple of mean artifacts, such as Lich's Tomb, which is four generic for an artifact. You don't lose the game for having zero or less life. And whenever you lose life, sacrifice a burden for each one life you lost. We also have Grid Monitor, which is for generic for a 4-6 creature. You cannot play creature spells. So there's a lot of really interesting ways of being able to switch your opponent's best things onto your side of the battlefield. Or maybe uh, your opponent has a activated ability that requires mana that you can just switch onto another player who doesn't have the required mana. And switch some artifacts and enchantments over to your player to your right to really wreak some havoc on the game. There are not very many ways of building this. But there are definitely a lot of ways of playing this, and I'm really excited to be playing this commander on our next episode of Duel of the Peaks for Jumpstart. And we also have a deck tech on it on our channel right now, and we will link it on the video and in the description below. All right, next up we have Ormos, Archive Keeper. He is a legendary creature Sphinx that costs four blue blue. He has flying, and he says if you would draw a card while your library has no cards in it, instead put five plus one plus one counters on Ormos, Archive Keeper. He then has an activated ability for one blue blue, discard three cards with different names, draw five cards. 
So Ormos is super interesting. He is like the opposite of Jace Wilder of Mysteries, Laboratory Maniac, and Thassa's Oracle, which all three want you to have zero cards in your library and you immediately just win the game. Instead, Ormos, when you have no cards left in your library, every single draw spell turns into Ormos getting super huge. Also, it, w it also stops you from losing the game as well. So as long as Ormos is on the battlefield and your library is empty, you're not going to lose the game. Just instead, Ormos is just going to get bigger and bigger. So if I were to build the deck, I would definitely want to be taking advantage of his activated ability. I actually think that's the most interesting part of his card is the fact that you can pay three mana, discard three cards and draw five cards. That's that I feel is good enough card advantage and I feel like there's a lot of support for draw tribal in mono blue. There are a couple of ways of even doubling the amount of cards you draw with Teferi's Ageless Insight. It's a brand new card that came out in Core 21. And it says if you would draw a card except the first one you draw in each of your draw steps, draw two cards instead. So with Teferi's Aegis Insight out and you activate Ormos, discard your three cards and draw five, you're actually going to be drawing ten cards, which is awesome for three mana. I'd probably run the route also as Spell Slinger, so I'd be playing lots of enchantments to capitalize on playing instants and sorceries such as metallurgic summoning tower sky summoner murmuring mystic basically all of the permanents that give us token creatures every time we cast an instant or sorcery also cards like chasm skulker and nadir kraken are super useful in this deck uh you activate almost once and you're going to be making a ton of tokens so an interaction that i think would be hilarious and i'm interested to see how it would play out is with thought reflection or Teferi's Ageless Insight on the table, and you cast Enter the Infinite, which is a massive blue sorcery that says you draw cards equal to the number of cards in your library, uh, you're going to end up drawing twice the number of cards in your library, and Ormos, would that work? The way that like the, the, the stack triggers, like you stack, um, I think that works, right? Ormos does, would yeah. get five counters for every card that, so basically if you have 60 cards left in your library, and you draw 60 cards twice so the first 60 would deplete your library and then the sex the second 60 would give um or almost 300 counters mm -hmm. that's ridiculous that's nuts that's he, insane he, uh, that's like as close to going infinite without going infinite that you can get in mono blue i think yeah but other cards i mean jace's archivist windfall uh basically you want to be drawing a ton of cards and if you have a way of protecting ormos if you're playing a ton of counter spells and you're able to turn Ormos into a threat, I mean, he he can win you the game, I think. I think it's a little risky, though, to rely on that because if you empty your library and you have Ormos out and they just spot removal him, you're kind of screwed, I think, unless you have ways of, like, instant speed shuffling your library, your hand or graveyard back into your library. But I think it's a super interesting commander. Next up, we've got Kale's Fight Fixer. For two black black, we have a legendary creature, Azra Warlock from our favorite plane of Battle Bond. With Menace, whenever you sacrifice a creature, you may pay Demir, blue black, if you do draw a card. And also, for one generic, you can sacrifice a creature. Kel's Fight Fixer gains indestructible until end of turn. You know, I really love commanders and I really love cards that have an effect that gives you an advantage, but also has the way of using that effect on the card. So with Kels, we're going to be building a Demir Aversocrats deck that essentially just uses Kels as our draw engine or um, just a, a way of being able to keep our hands filled. So some awesome cards we could put in here are cards like Ophiomancer, which gives us a snake every upkeep if we don't control a snake, so we can just pay two sacrifice a snake, draw a card, make Kels indestructible, and then create another snake on the next upkeep. Uh, Ghoul Caller Gisa for three black black. We have a legendary creature human wizard that can tap and sacrifice a creature and create X2-2 two, two zombies, which is just great because we can just get more creatures to sacrifice. Endrex Star Master Breeder, which can give you thralls when you cast a creature. And all of these cards are already good in Aristocrats deck, so we just need to pile on top of it the Blood Artist, Zulaport Cutthroat triggers that drain our opponents, and things like Pawn of Ulamog and Pitiless Plunder that can give us a lot of advantage off of sacrificing our creatures. I think Pitiless Plunder might be the best card in the deck with Phyrexian Altar, honestly. Because, like, whenever... Because Pitiless Plunder doesn't care what creature dies. Like, if it's any creature, you get a treasure. You can basically sacrifice, like, your Pawn of Ulamog tokens, like, to themselves to generate the mana, and then Pitiless Plunder gives you a treasure, like... It's actually, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for this deck, and I don't think that you're ever, I don't think people are ever going to target Kels with the removal because she doesn't necessarily win on her own. She just gives you a lot of card advantage, and she can protect herself. So I, I'm really enjoying and really looking forward to the builds that come out of Kels. Yeah, I think I would rather have like a card advantage engine in my command zone rather than like 
half of the synergy for a deck in the command zone. So, and I think that's why Regna and Krav are amazing because Krav is arguably like the best card advantage engine in an Aristocrats deck. Like you can turn one black man into how many cards? 10, 20, like it's nuts. Kels isn't quite that good, but like I, 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 I love seeing commanders that say draw a card on them. Like I think there's, they're so nice to play. Yeah, and this is a this is definitely the first time we've seen this good of an aristocrats commander in Demir. Yeah, I don't think we've had a Demir aristocrat. I mean, we've had Grim Grim. I mean, we've had Grim but... Grim. We have like Lazav, which is semi aristocrat. Yeah, but... yeah. This is better. Definitely better. All right. Next up, we have Tiny Bones, Trinket Thief. He is a legendary creature, skeleton rogue that costs one in a black. And he says, at the beginning of each end step, if an opponent discarded a card this turn, you draw a card and you lose one life. He then has an activated ability that reads four black black. Each opponent with no cards in hand loses 10 life. So Tiny Bones is, I would say, the best discard commander that we have. Would you say so? Best discard commander? Oh, absolutely. Um, By far. Yeah. So I've, I've contemplated building a couple different... Uh, discard decks before Tiny Bones came out. And the issue that I ran into at every single point in those decks is you are essentially running out of cards just as fast as your opponents are. Um, a lot of times you're just kind of one for oneing. I mean, sometimes like with some of the discard spells, you are making an opponent, you know, discard two or three cards and yeah, you traded one card for two or three. But that doesn't really give you an engine. And if that if that opponent has already has like some type of engine on board, like making them discard a couple of cards might not be that relevant. Um, so Tiny Bones kind of remedies that because he refills the cards in your hand when you, you make your opponents discard. So you're basically all those discard spells become cantrips. They they re, they replace themselves. You're not you're not going back in card advantage. While and your opponents are going back in card advantage. That's awesome. He then has a payoff stapled on him too. I mean, making each opponent with no cards in their hand lose ten life. I mean, that's absolutely brutal. It's possible that you could, you know, get Tiny Bones down on turn two and maybe by turn three or turn four with the right ramp and right setup i mean you could be doming your opponents for 10 20 life and the game could be over super quickly um and he is a one two which is super weak but you have to remember that your opponents probably aren't going to have any cards in hand they, they might not have a way of removing tiny bones unless their commander has some aspect of removal on it or they, you know they get lucky and top deck something but i have a full deck tech on this on this commander and that'll be in the show notes you can you can go watch that video um, I go over all the cards in the deck and it's a pretty oppressive deck. I would make sure that your play group kind of knows what they're getting into. Um, a lot of people don't like this type of strategy because they feel like they're all just sitting there watching you play magic. So we can, un we understand that like that could be oppressive, but just let your play group know that, yeah, you're going to be making, um, kind of hate life. So that's tiny bones. Moving on to red, we have Muxus Goblin Grandee, which is 4 red red for a 4-4 four, four legendary creature Goblin Noble. He reads, when Muxus Goblin Grandee enters the battlefield, reveal the top 6 cards of your library. Put all Goblin creature cards with converted mana cost 5 or less from among them onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. He also reads, whenever Muxus attacks, it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn for each other Goblin you control. Now, Muxus is a very interesting commander, and we have a couple of other really good goblin commanders already in edh we have things like kiki jiki we have og parfros we have krenko mob boss and, and krenko tin street kingpin but there is a lot of that is, there's a lot of cool things you can do with muxus so the first thing that you want to do with muxus is just fill your deck with a bunch of goblins already as you would do with a goblin tribal deck but you can bounce muxus to get that effect because it's whenever he enters the battlefield so if you have something like a conjurer's closet at the end of every at the end of your end step, you blink Muxus, it returns to the battlefield, you get another top six with all the goblins coming onto the battlefield. Next, and we also have Erratic Portal, which is a four mana artifact for one generic. You can tap it, return target creature to its owner's hand unless its controller pays one. So we can essentially just play Muxus every turn. Instead of having to cast our, our goblins, we just cast Muxus every turn to get all those goblins out. Also, you can cast Muxus from your hand like six or seven times, and if he goes back to the command zone, that's only going to increase his command attacks by like by two, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it only counts when he mm -hmm. leaves the command zone yeah. and goes back. Also, like we have, we don't have the statistics in front of us, but like I'm wondering how many goblins are there that cost more than five? Like, besides that, that's, Muxus. that was something I was thinking of. Is why did they say that costs less than five? Is there one super abusive goblin? Kiki Jiki cost six. Oh, Kiki Jiki is yeah. Like, so there's okay. Kiki Jiki, and you can't. You, okay, so you can't like cheat Kiki Jiki into play. But like, oh, that's stupid. I want to cheat Kiki Jiki into play. So there's so many other ways of cheating Kiki Jiki into play. That's very true. Yeah. But honestly, uh, all in all. 
Conspicuous Snoop. You, Cons have. you know, you have Conspicuous Snoop. You have Krenko. What's that goblin that lets you, like, stack the top of your library with other goblins? Is that goblin, goblin matron? matron. That's so good. Goblin matron in this deck is phenomenal because you just essentially just stack all the goblins on top of your deck. You keep blinking Muxus and get all the goblins onto the battlefield. Yeah, I mean, so this is kind of like Winota where um, you're cheating things from the top of your library into play, but this... You get you can get all six. You you can hit six goblins off the top and put six goblins into play. I would much rather cast Muxus for six than have to pay the individual cost of each of the goblins that are coming off the top of my deck. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, if you got a well, one, two, three, one, two, I mean that's already more than six. Well, mana. And, well, and think about it. Like your opponents can't counter all those goblin spells. They're 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 being put into play. Like you, they're, it's really hard to interact with. And even if they kill Muxus right when it enters the battlefield, like it doesn't matter. Like the damage has been done. Like he already summoned all of his goblin dudes. Like next up we have Sethron, her loon general, and I don't know how that second word is pronounced. He is a legendary creature, Minotaur Warrior. He costs three red red. And he reads, whenever Sethron, Herloon General, or another non-token Minotaur enters a battlefield under your control, create a 2-3 red Minotaur creature token. He then has an activated ability that says, for two hybrid red black, Minotaurs you control get plus one plus zero and gain menace and haste until end of turn. That activated ability is so cool. Like, it gives them haste. That's awesome. Like, for three mana... Think about it, you cast like a couple Minotaurs, get, you know, four or five tokens, give them all haste and menace and plus one plus oh, like, I don't know, I think he's got, he's kind of got it all. He doesn't have card draw, but that's okay. Um, he makes you tokens and he gives you a way of making those tokens lethal. I think that he's a pretty fun commander, um, probably better than the other Minotaur generals, I think. Oh yeah, he's definitely the best Minotaur general by far. I mean, you just look at what Ren and Siri did in our last gameplay and it just shows you that you can never underestimate a commander that give you creatures off of casting creatures you already want to cast. Yeah. So, I mean, before this, we've had Mogus and that's about it. We've had Mogus and... Uh, Neheb. Yeah, we've had... Neheb the Worthy. Yeah, uh, Mogus and Neheb and that's but, about like, it. But like, both of them go into this deck. So like, yeah, cool. That's all I have to say about that. Hey guys, Caleb here to talk about one and only one card for this set review, Naeth of the Dire Hunt. Naeth costs two generic and two green mana to cast. She's a legendary creature, human warrior, and she says whenever one or more creatures you control fight or become blocked, draw a card. Having card draw stapled onto a commander is absolutely fantastic, especially when it's got another ability that makes drawing that card a whole lot easier. Her second ability says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may pay two and a hybrid green red. If you do, double target creature's power until end of turn. That creature must be blocked this combat if able. Being able to keep our hand constantly fueled with more cards is super important in an aggressive gruel strategy and Naeth does an awesome job at making sure that you never run out of cards. One really important clarification that is easy to miss is that if you have 10 creatures block at the same time, you still only draw one card due to Naeth's ability. If it said whenever a creature you control fights or becomes blocked draw a card, then you would get one for each creature that did so. So again, when you play a card like Azuri's Predation, which makes you a 4-4 beast for each creature your opponents control, and then each of those beasts fights a different creature that your opponents control, and then you get five beasts that all fight at the same time, you're still only going to draw one card. To get the most out of Naeth, you're obviously going to be focusing on creatures and fighting, but you can take this in an infect direction, or death touch, or huge creatures, or a combination of any of these strategies. One of the first types of creatures that you should consider running in a Naeth deck are creatures that have the ability to fight stapled right on them. Cards like Kogla the Titan Ape, which fights when he enters the battlefield, or Ulvenwald Tracker that has an activated ability that lets you choose two creatures and force them to fight are perfect for Naeth and are going to get you a ton of cards. Also consider running five to eight other cards that toss your creatures into the ring, such as Arena or Satessan Tactics or Primal Might. There are tons of instants and sorceries that you can choose from to force your creatures to fight your own creatures or your opponent's creatures. You've got a ton to choose from. I would just go with whatever the best ones you have. Be sure to throw in some big creatures with death touch as well, such as Worm Coil Engine and Ronus the Indomitable. When you swing in with Ronus or Worm Coil Engine, you are forcing your opponents to decide between taking a ton of damage and losing a creature plus allowing you to draw a card. 
Another card that I'm super excited to play in Naeth is Hornet Nest. It says, whenever Hornet Nest is dealt damage, put that many 1-1 green insect creature tokens with flying and death touch onto the battlefield. This card will have multiple functions in a Naeth deck, the first being that it can prevent your opponents from attacking you with anything too big without Trampler flying, of course, because they don't want to deal your Hornet Nest a bunch of damage because then you just get to create a bunch of flying death touchers and that is absolutely terrifying. You can also use one of your instant speed fight spells to get one of their huge creatures to fight with Hornet Nest and then you'll be trading it in for an army of Hornets. Anyway, as you can tell, I'm super stoked for this card so be sure to check out my upcoming deck tech for Naeth coming out next week. Thanks for letting me hop on, Landon and Griffin. Switching gears a little, we're going to be going over the not legendary creature cards, so just the normal cards in the set that are brand new, not no reprints. Um, starting off uh, with Archaeomender. It's a creature human wizard that costs two and a blue. And when Archaeomender enters a battlefield, return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. This is we've basically seen a card like this before with Archaeomancer, except for it's two and a, two and two blue. It returns an instant sorcery to your hand. Archaeomander cares about artifacts. Um, there are a lot of artifacts in blue decks. There are a lot of artifacts just in commander in general. You're playing a lot of mana rocks, you're playing a lot of lightning greaves, swift foot boots, and a lot of those are pretty hot targets for removal spells. Like if you've got a problem some commander and somebody wants to take out your lightning greaves because they can't get to your commander yet, Archaeomender can bring those lightning greaves back, or it can bring back a Wayfarer's Bauble that you could use again and get another land into play. It can get back a Soul Ring that was spitefully blown up at the beginning of the game because you're opponents are afraid you're going to go off with it or something like that. I just think that it has a lot of utility. I don't know that it automatically goes into every single blue deck, but I think it's worth considering in a lot of blue decks. Next up, we have Witch of the Moors, which is three at black black for a 4-4 creature human warlock with death touch. It reads at the beginning of your end step, if you gain life this turn, each opponent sacrifices a creature and you return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Now, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I love this card. First off, you can use this effect the turn that it comes out. So let's say you play Witch of the Moors, you're playing a Regnan Crab or you're playing a Veto deck, you gain life, at the end of the turn that trigger will go on and cause your opponents to sacrifice a creature and you will get a return of creature back to your hand. Now that's the second thing is that it applies to each of your opponents and it also gives you a benefit off of it. So just for gaining life, you're getting so many things off of it by making all of your opponents lose a creature and you're gaining a creature. That is a lot of value for just gaining life, especially in a deck where you're already trying to gain life. And then the third thing is Len and I were talking about this is that you should never underestimate something that has death touch. You'd be surprised how many people are going to swing away or swing at somebody else just because simply they don't want to give up one of their best creatures for something that has death touch. Even though he's a 4-4, don't underestimate the death touch on creatures. Yeah, just because like your opponents are investing mana into their creatures when they cast them and they want to be able to get several attacks out of their creatures. And if they attack into a death touch creature, they're not going to be able to use it to hit their opponents. So I think a lot of times like a death touch creature works almost like a propaganda or ghostly ghostly prison so kind of a side tangent off of which of the moors that i kind of thought of but yeah some good cards that would fit uh with a witch of the moors in the decks that where you're playing it are things like sangromancer the soul sisters extor is an amazing mechanic i think even like um grave pact effects too um wait does it say each opponent or each player no each opponent oh never and mind you return a creature back yeah, to your hand yeah yeah that's so good uh, it slots so well in a a uh, Regnan Crab deck, a Veto deck, a, an Aloro deck. Just any deck where you're already planning on getting life, this is just a, a powerhouse that gives you so much advantage for just so little. Moving on to red, we have Immolating Gyre. It is a sorcery that costs four red red. It reads, Immolating Gyre deals X damage to each creature and planeswalker you don't control, where X is the number of instants and sorcery cards in your graveyard. I... I really like this card and I'm going to make a little bit of a hot take kind of comparing it to Cyclonic Rift. So Cyclonic Rift, you overload it for seven mana and you return all non-land permanents you don't control to their owner's hands. So Cyclonic Rift, you want to cast it and hopefully you're going to want to be winning in the turn or two after you've Cyclonic Rifted because your opponents are going to start deploying the cards that you bounce back to their hand again and they can eventually rebuild if you don't win the game. What I like about Immolating Gyre is with a little bit of set setup, this is a very good one-sided board wipe. And I think that this card is very useful in the Spellslinger decks because I play a lot of Spellslinger. I've built a ton of Spellslinger decks. And one of the things I'm always wary of is just being over overrun by creatures because most Spellslinger decks, 
sacrifice playing creatures to playing a higher density of instants and sorceries, copying spells, looking for instants and sorcery payoffs, and a lot of times you just you just get overrun by creatures. So I think Immolating Gyre is super nice in Kai card decks that, you know, you make a ton of spirits, you can sacrifice those spirits to cast the Immolating Gyre so you can ramp it out a little bit earlier. Or maybe in, in you know, super great in Kess where you're wanting to put a lot of instants and sorceries in your graveyard. It's super, basically any, any spell slinger deck. I mean, even down, I think Calamax would even like this too. I mean, if you can copy this and deal a ton of damage, that'd be super cool too. Also, Immolating Gyre pairs super well with this enchantment called repercussion cost one red red and whenever a creature is dealt damage repercussion deals that much damage to that creature's controller so let's say you've got you know six seven little cantrips in your graveyard you've been casting throughout the game you drop repercussion you cast emulating gyre the more creatures your opponents have the more damage they're going to be taking in the end it's possible that that could just end the game you could just win i think that's super cool it's huge pain in the butt that repercussion has spiked up to thirty dollars like recently but yeah super cool interaction there i also love that it doesn't exile itself so you can bring it back multiple times say if you're playing something like cast where you can cast this and then you your opponents know that you can cast it again from your graveyard which may stop them from casting so many creatures which is really what you want in a spell slinger deck is to stop your opponents from casting so many creatures and drowning you out next up moving on to green we have probably the best card that has come out what are we fawning over? Well, it's Allosaurus Shepherd. For one green, we have a 1-1 one, one creature elf shaman. Allosaurus Shepherd can't be countered. Green spells you control can't be countered. It's not just green creature spells. It's not just green instance and sorcerer spells. It's any green spell you control can't be countered. And also for four green green until end of turn, each elf creature you control has base power and toughness 5-5 five, five and becomes a dinosaur in addition to its other tripes. This just slots into every single green deck in the history of ever for the rest of time. It doesn't even matter that this is an elf focused card. It just fits into every green deck. I mean, Solvala, yeah. Yisan Wanderer Bard. I mean, he's cheating things into play, but... Um, but wouldn't it be nice to just know that Yisan can't be countered? Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, it's turn one. Yeah, it's turn one. But like, also think about like, think about the haymakers in green. Like, think of things that like in green that end the game. Overwhelming Stampede. Crater Hoof Behemoth. Crater Hoof Behemoth. Triumph of the Hordes. Triumph of the Hordes. Tooth and Nail. Finale of Devastation. Tooth and Nail. Like, even Salvala ends games, and your opponents can't do anything about it. They can't kill Crater Hoof Behemoth when he comes into play, hoping to stop his ETB trigger from going off. You have to stop it on the stack. You have to stop it on the stack. And that's that's why it's so good, is because green cares about creatures and cares about, like, there are a lot of good ETBs in green. Oh, it's so good. As a control player... Uh, one of my least favorite cards when I used to play standard was Carnage Tyrant because as the control player playing blue, nothing was more frustrating than having such a big threat, not being able to be countered, not being able to be interacted with. This Allosaurus Shepherd just screams pain in the butt for me. And that and that just makes it that just makes it so good. But even even so, it does care about elves. It is an elf, so you can put it into Morrow in the Nurture, you can put it into Azuri, Claw of Progress, or Azuri Renegade Leader it goes super, super good into Momir Vig. I mean, this this card is just absolutely nuts, and I I'm definitely recommend that you guys pick up this card if you're playing green a lot, because this card is going to spike up, I think, the most in this set. I'm not a financial I'm not a financial guy, but this one screams to me that it's going to become expensive very, very quickly. Next up, we have Branching Evolution. It's an enchantment that costs two and a green. And it reads, if one or more plus one plus one counters would be put on a creature you control, twice that many plus one plus one counters are put on that creature instead. Uh, yeah, so it's like doubling season, but with just plus one plus one counters. Um, I mean, this is something that we've seen a lot. It's kind of like Unbound Flourishing. We saw that. Was that Core 20? I think that's a super good card. Oh, Unbound Flourishing is Modern Horizons. I apologize. Yeah, this is super cool. I'm probably going to put this in Tyam. Tyam really cares about counters on creatures because you can pay three mana and remove counters from creatures to mill three and reanimate something that costs three or less. This is super good in Tyam. Actually, I haven't looked into it yet, but I'm I'm sure that this actually might go infinite somehow with Tyam too. Oh, it definitely is very yeah. easily can get infinite. And even if it doesn't go infinite, this goes super well in Zexara where you're already creating a, just a lot of plus one plus one counters on, on creatures and hydras. Uh, this goes really well in Atraxa if you're doing a proliferating Atraxa because every time you proliferate the counters on your creatures, it doubles. Uh, Azuri Claw of Progress again, where you're getting a bunch of plus one plus one counters. I mean, it's just it's just a very good enchantment that I also expect will be jumping up in price. Probably not as big as you know something like. Well, how, how uh, much was Unbound Flourishing? Unbound Flourishing is only 10? like seven dollars, seven or eight dollars. I think it'll be around there, maybe I th five. I, I think so because yeah. it 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 
Unbound Flourishing only cared about X spells, but this cares about any creature that's going to get a plus one plus one counter. So I think it's going to be around 10 to $15. Easy. The 15th card that we want to talk about is actually multiple cards. It's going to be the land cycle from Jumpstart. Now the land cycle is called the Thriving Lands. And what essentially they are is you have one for each color, white, blue, black, red, green, except they come in tapped and when they enter the battlefield, you can choose another color other than the one that you have. So say for instance, we have Thriving Bluff when it enters the battlefield tapped. And as it enters the battlefield, choose a color other than red, and then it can tap for red or one mana of the chosen color. I think these lands are very, very good. I think these are going to be amazing budget lands. I really hope that they stay down in price. That's 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 my hope because they're just much better than guild gates. They go really well in two, three, four, five color decks. As you increase colors, it gets better. And I mean, especially in send triplets where I'm trying to create mana that I don't have access to, these, these lands are, are really great. So I will be switching out these lands for my guild gates and for most of my other tap lands for probably the rest of time. All right, that's about it for our review of Jumpstart, guys. Those are our 15 recommendations for the best card in Jumpstart that you guys should be picking up when this set releases. Please let us know in the comments which you think are going to be the best and which you think are going to be the most powerful in your play groups and what cards you are most excited to build with and build around. And if there's anything else that we missed on these creatures or if there's anything else we missed with these cards, maybe other cards that they interact with, feel free to let us know in the comments. We're super interested in maybe seeing some interactions that we missed. We probably missed a lot of interactions, so we appreciate your guys' patience. And finally, if you aren't already subscribed, please remember to like and subscribe to this channel. We really appreciate every single person that's jumping on and supporting us. We appreciate you guys and we love you, and we hope you guys join us through our adventure. Without further ado, that is it for this episode. Please stay tuned for all of our future deck techs. A lot of these legendary creatures are going to be having deck techs that will come out in the shortcoming weeks. So we look forward to seeing you guys on those. Without further ado, that is it. Have a good night and we'll see you next time. Bye. You know, like, that's a cool axe. I mean, look at it. Man, now I'm split. Do I build sword tribal or axe tribal? Ah, oh, man, that's hard.